All right. Okay, guys, we're going to have Dr. Law uh, start her lecture. Wait, do I, need, do I need to talk with my mask? Whatever you want to do. All right. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm going to violate the mask. <laughs> no, you just have to stand with one foot up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just like that. Okay. Got, got to be more of a style. Am I, am I still muted? No, I'm not. You're not muted. Um, hello. There's a lot of plastic on these seats. Okay, I just, I mean, that's the first thing that came to my mind. Like, plastic. It's but, like a more It's cold. Yes. <laughs> so, anyway, anyway, good morning. Um, it is my absolute pleasure. Um, I think we have a relatively full house with social distancing. How about this is a joke? Okay. Um, I'm here to talk. My name is Susan Long. I'm here to talk about venous thrombosis. Um, I want to thank the Emergency Medicine to in inviting me because uh, that means that you liked my previous lecture and you're inviting me again to talk more about stroke and stroke related illnesses. I'm so excited because I love talking about stroke. Um, and as you know, that the uh, ED um, residents are rotating in stroke rotation uh, at the county where we see uh, stroke from basically uh, soup to nuts. Uh, they visit them when they have the show code, follow them in the their ICU, and now we also follow, we actually take care of them on the ward. And sometimes we visit them in rehab when they have a nice friendly stroke concept. So I'm very excited. Um, thank you for inviting me, and today we're here to talk about cerebral venous thrombosis. Uh, the reason why I like to talk about cerebral venous thrombosis is it's, although it's not that as common as arterial strokes, it is, um, it is a known entity of the venous system. Um, you know, usually, these occur in younger people, and you quickly identify, diagnose, and manage these patients. You can actually uh, take care of them, and we actually have very good outcomes. And that's why I do this for every, every year for the neurology residents. But I also think it's very important to have this in the ED residency because you're going to have them when they come to the ER. So cerebral venous thrombosis. Okay, I think I have Yes, okay. So um, CVT, or cerebral venous thrombosis, is a type of stroke that causes thrombosis of the dural sinuses or cerebral veins. It is really rare. It's 1.2 to 1.5 per 100,000. It's not as common as the arterial version of the ischemic strokes. And the largest cohort, which is based on all of our uh, treatment, our diagnosis, and our management, is based on the international study of the cerebral venous neural sinus thrombosis. And uh, interesting enough, about three-fourths of that population is very young. It's less than 50 years of age. So we're talking about a very young population. Young population, good prognosis if treated early. And during the acute phase, if you identify this patient very early and treat, 75% will have full recovery. So it's important to have, diagnosis is key in these patients. The increased risk um, in general, patients who have CBT, they have increased risk of other types of venous thrombosis, including PE, CBTs, and the reoccurrence rate is not that high. Uh, it's 1.5 per 100 person per year. And, uh, you thought you will never see this, right? <laughs> Let alone the arterial version, right? Uh, whenever I have ED residents um, rotating in stroke, I always ask them, oh, let's talk about the arteries. And they, they have this like sigh, like, oh my God, I haven't studied this since, the, since medical school. But then if I even show them the veins, uh, they, I get both neurology residents and ED residents <laughs> will get me so upset. Um, please don't be upset. It's hard. Um, I didn't fully appreciate this until my stroke fellowship, but I wish someone taught me this when I was going through my residency program. So, um, can we actually see my arrow? Yes, we can. Okay, great. On Zoom, too. This is great. Like, you guys have amazing technology. <laughs> so, the main, the big, big old fat one here is the um, superior sexual sinus. Now, here are the transfer sinus. The sigmoid and goes to the jug and goes into the internal jug. And I try, I try to be fancy. My, my husband helped me. 
Uh, vein of Galen is the most common vein that you'll see in venous um, development in pediatric venous thrombosis. And whereas the vein of Rosenthal is actually commonly occluded when you have bilateral thalamic strokes and can cause pulmonary. That is, this is actually considered one of the more dangerous. Uh, most, uh, most neurologists come up to me and say, no, Dr. Wah, I think that the superior sinus thrombosis is actually more dangerous. And actually it isn't, you know, uh, the one that's most dangerous one is actually causing impaired draining of the uh, bilateral thalamus, which is usually the vein of open salt, and that actually can cause instant coma and death. So um, this is the pathophysiology. Um, I always ask, the first question I ask is, um, what type of edema do you get with ischemic stroke? And they say, well, if it's an arterial stroke, it's cytotoxic edema. What type of edema do you get in tumors? They say it's basogenic edema. Um, for um, cerebral venous thrombosis, it's actually basogenic edema that causes all the impairment and neurological deficits. So what usually happens is that the venous occlusion, uh, they get focal edema, which is uh, basogenic edema. Then that's what causes the increased venous pressure. Then you develop collateral pathways from other uh, veins, and then that causes disruption, and then that causes bleed. And by the time you have your casket, there's a bleed in the brain. So um, the etiology, and this is something that um, is important to as the patient goes uh, across throughout the hospital in their journey through the hospitalization, is that we always try to find out what is the main cause of this venous thrombosis. Um, at least 1%, uh, one risk factor is identified in 85 patients based on our largest cohort that we have. And the most common is actually um, pro-thrombotic conditions, oral contraceptive use, pregnancy status, infection, and malignancy. And 50% of these patients actually have multiple risk factors. So it's not just enough to say, okay, this person was on oral contraceptives, I'm gonna hang my hat. It's actually, um, it's worthwhile to actually investigate multiple risk factors. And the most common risk factor is the, is a mouthful, G2, G2021-09 prothrombic polymorphism. That is actually the most common, as well as factor V Leiden. But factor V Leiden is usually in the Caucasian population and Swedish population, which I don't think we cater to that type of population. <laughs> um, I think that we mostly cater to the protein C and APL syndrome, which is anti-phospholipid syndrome population. So um, whenever they come to the stroke clinic as an outpatient, where I think Dr. Valesky is due for stroke clinic this week, so, uh, I, I, every once in a while he actually sees um, a patient and he notices that, you know, um, every once in a while we see an APL syndrome with cerebral venous thrombosis. This is a bit busy slide, but I'm going to email it to the um, this is just basically facts on what we see, um, what are the main causes based on the largest cohort that we have. And as you can see, the majority of them are from oral contraceptives, but they have multiple risk factors. 50% of them have So it's worthwhile to have them. The important part is that once you take care of them, they need good follow up in, with a uh, vascular neurologist or general neurologist to make sure that they don't have any more risk factors that we need to take care of. Um, so there are genetic risk factors, um, for example, um, patients with sarcoidosis, as well as inflammatory disorders, such as the Shedson, have this type of uh, cerebral venous thrombosis. But I always say drugs, drugs, drugs. Tell me what drugs they're taking. Um, we typically get patients who are um, breast cancer survivors, they're under treatment, and they're on tamoxifen or any other um, uh, therapy medication, and we actually find out that they develop supervenous thrombosis. So uh, these are a list of medications that, again, I will email the chief resident this slide, so it's just important for your education uh, later on. But um, predominantly, uh, pediatric stroke population is also affected with cerebral venous thrombosis, where they say that 98% of the cases are identified by risk factor. Uh, in children, it's actually due to a, an acute systemic illness, which is uh, prenatal complications or dehydration. And uh, for children, they usually have cancers or hematological disorders. For women, oral contraceptive use is six times higher.
higher relative risk of developing cerebral venous thrombosis. And so um, we also have now that women are women are trying to um, freeze their eggs, and so they actually have due to in, in vitro fertilization, we're actually seeing increased cerebral venous thrombosis due to ovarian hyperstimulation. Um, pregnancy. We get this all the time. We always get consults from OBGYN saying, please rule out cerebral venous thrombosis. Thank you. Have a nice day. And I say, oh, I'm absolutely delighted for your consultation. However, uh, the newest, uh, the newest actually paper that came out that in 2019, it was a case control study that they found that it's 3.5 higher risk, but it's only postpartum. It's actually predominantly postpartum. So Whenever we get like a CBT, rule out CBT in the third trimester, it's not as likely as a postpartum patient, which is in the first six weeks after. So we, have, we always tell them, thank you very much for this fascinating and interesting console. And um, we usually tell them, most likely it is not cerebral venous process. And um, so there's usually five case scenarios. And this is actually, you know, a very Wonderful slide. I try to divide it to make it simple for not only emergency medicine physicians, but also neurology residents to go and answer stroke. Usually, a cerebral venous thrombosis has five clinical scenarios. One is um, for the headache. They have papilledema and visual deficit. They don't have anything more than that. The second one is when they have a focal one, which is seizures. The third one is encephalopathy. They have executive dysfunction, delirium. The fourth one is cavernous sinus syndrome, which we all know has autonomia associated with osteoporosis, prosthosis, and then there's the multiple cranial nerve. I think that over here, you guys usually call neurology. I think the main, and maybe here, I think you call neurology here too. Usually here is case one and three is a little bit challenging, and it requires um, a fundoscopic exam as well as evaluation. Um, my experience is that you usually see something on the CAT scan, either scenario three, so that you can see. Um, depending on the location, you get their different clinical features. The superior sagittal signs and the transverse signs are the most commonly, so they're the most commonly affected areas or locations of cerebral venous thrombosis. And I say this, if this is, if if you had to take a picture or a snapshot of the slides, this is actually one of the most important slides that I think. It's, it really tells you when to start making that switch that this is not arterial stroke or this is not a bleed, this is a venous problem. And usually it's from the topography of the edema, hemorrhage, and ischemia. And this is actually a breakdown of the types of edema or infection versus the hemorrhage. Because one of the things that is most important is identifying and then immediately ordering that MRV or MRI with contrast. So um, one of the most common ones is this type. You see a lobar hemorrhage in the temporal lobe. We commonly think it's cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Well, because it's in that area. Um, but actually, sometimes we say, no, I think that this could be a, well, this could be a, a cerebral venous thrombosis. And I actually have some examples that I would like to go over. I feel like everyone is on the edge of their seat. They want to be involved in this, so I'm, I'm going to push on forward. There's only 45 slides, I swear. <laughs> and over here, as, as you can see, this is the bilateral down line one, which is extremely deadly. And this is due to a vein of, this is the inferior sagittal signs as well as vein of the ball. So which one's better, CTV versus MRV? I always get that question. Um, now I'm going to give you the answer. So now when I see you, I say, I think this is a cerebral being in the song. You'll tell me, well, they're both good, reliable alternatives in this, uh, this test. So CTV is highly sensitive to actually look at the cerebral venous uh, circulation. However, the MRV is better in detecting the promise. So um, in if you are worried about an internal or a uh, deep vein thrombosis versus a superior sagittal sinus thrombosis, it's better off to do a uh, CT, CTV with runoff um, because that MRV will not actually show um, those veins inside the brain. 
Um, if you are worried about superior sagittal sinus thrombosis, then you can't really tell whether it's edema versus press, then the MRV is actually your best. So um, I took a picture of this in my old textbook because I couldn't find it in, on the internet, but um, there are multiple signs of the, on the CAT scan. Uh, there's two main signs. There's the empty delta and the cord sign. The empty delta here is um, when you do a CAT scan, it looks like a bright signal at the superior sagittal sinus. And the cord sign is actually over, it goes along all around here. Actually, you see a little bit over here. And that's a sign of a cortical vein thrombosis or a transverse sinus thrombosis, depending on your location. So those are the two main radiographic signs that you see through the venous thrombosis. Um, patients, uh, I always get the question, why don't you get a D-dimer, um, Dr. Wald, and it will help us. And usually it's due to the OBGYN consultation. Um, however, prolonged duration of symptoms are associated with false negative D-dimers, especially if it's, uh, symptoms are prolonged more than one week. So usually we say, no, D-dimer is not that valid. Let's move forward from that. So um, this is where I think you see people get interesting. I don't know if I can, can I actually pick people from Zoom as well? Um, yeah, you can call out. Oh, good, 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 good. How do I do that? They're hearing you, so you can basically just scroll and see. Oh, I need Hello. Uh, so, Dr. Chow, was that not? Um, so, uh, so, Dr. Chow, let's talk about this case. This is actually a case that's very exciting. I'm so excited about this. Okay, so just forget that you had this lecture, right? So, this lady oh. comes, like, hmm, I, I know it's cerebral venous thrombosis, but let's just present this. This is actually straight from the medical part. It's a 33-year-old woman who was on oral contraceptive medication, came to with all mental status seizure, and she's only on oral contraceptives. She's a stay-at-home mother, class got home, scale 15. Um, airway status is room air, and she got, uh, you guys gave her a thousand of Capra. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, this is the scan. You ready? Yes. I hear muttering. <laughs> so, Priscilla, what do you think? Is, is, is this cat scan normal? Definitely not. I saw something very bright. <laughs> yeah, oh, see, this is great. I'm so glad. This is the same response I get from ED residents as well. So, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, and we will pick on another contestant. Okay. <laughs> so, um, let's see. So if you notice here, there's significant amount of edema here, and the bleed is right at the edge. And that's actually one of the telltale signs that this could actually be a uh, rather than a arterial. Actually, in fact, the arterial territory here is, it's crossing the arterial territory. The, the uh, temporal lobe is supplied by both MCA and PCA. And uh, MCA is here and PCA is here. So it's not respecting vascular arterial territory. So that makes you feel like it's more of a um, it's actually more likely due to this significant amount of edema and the sleep located near the um, edge. Do uh, you think that this is more of a sleep? Everyone knows this, I'm sure. Okay. Um, so during your first hour, you want to communicate, but um, one of the most important things is to calculate the, to make sure that there's no cardiopathy, um, as you know. So here, you guys remember this. This is Podromed, right? Okay, everyone had shivers. <laughs> like, okay, like we're not supposed to talk about Podromed anymore. Don't talk about it. Give us a case with Epic. Um, so um, let's, let's bring on another contestant. Are you able to see the names? I can't tell. Hello. Hello, Jake. Hi, Jay. Hi, Dr. Law. 
Hi, Jay. Um, oh, yes. Oh, wait, okay. <laughs> so, hi, Jay. So, um, do you remember Quadramed? I remember Quadramed. Okay. So, Jay, when you see this in Quadramed, do you think there's anything abnormal? Mm -hmm. You know, this is the lady with the fleet. I'm just reminding you. I know that you were very, like, engrossed in this presentation. This is, like, a very great presentation. <laughs> The platelets are a little low. Yeah. Uh, INR is a little elevated. And the INR is elevated. Yeah, so Jay, um, I have a question for you. Now that you have a bleed, most people will have a knee-jerk reaction and say, okay, I gotta get vitamin K. You see INR is elevated at 1.5. What would you wanna do? Mm. I hear, oh, he's thinking, okay, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I'd, are they anticoagulated? No, she's only on oral contraceptive medication and she got Keppra. Thank you very much, Evie. <laughs> I don't know if I'd do anything just now. Excellent, that is the right answer. Very good, Jay. Oh, I'm so proud of you. And you did rotate and stroke. I'm so happy. Cute. <laughs> <laughs> so that's exactly what we did. We stopped and we think and we actually rechecked it because it wasn't built all the way to the top. So we, we did it again because we knew that we were suspecting from the beginning of the CAT scan that this is a thrombosis and a vitamin K will actually bring the patient form. So we decided to repeat it and Found out lab. I always do this, and uh, it makes people say, "Stop and think." You have to be very strict. You have to be very strong in your conviction, and say that if I suspect that this is a cerebral venous thrombosis, I'm not going to hurt the patient. I'm going to. I have time. I'm going to rethink. So, um, of course, neurosurgery was called. They said nothing to do, and then of course neurology comes with their attending, and the attending says, "Please do more imaging." And it frustrates everyone because all you guys want to know is your dispo. But now we have our dispo with neuro ICU, and the ICH score is one. So, um, are you frustrated yet? No, because now you know that this is most likely a cerebral venous thrombosis. So you're going to proceed to do a uh, an evaluation of the of the vein. So you, of course, you describe it. It's left temporal, it's lobar. The risks are seizure, aspiration, pneumonia. So this is a this is actually this, um, the MRV of the patient. And notice here that the transverse sinus is completely obliterated. And this was uh, diagnosed with a vein of Lave, which is a, uh, one of the veins that comes off the transverse sinus um, occlusion. And the patient was quickly anticoagulated. But I'm supposed to tell you that this is actually the management chart. So um, you treat underlying cause, but you actually anticoagulate. Um, most people get a little nervous when you say, oh, there's an active bleed. Why should we anticoagulate? The anticoagulation actually prevents it from bleeding bigger. You are taking out the clot. So, um, and usually they have to do it in an ICU set. Usually if there's an improved neurological status, you usually um, evaluate. But sometimes, sometimes very little, the patient has declined neurological status and it's due to the increased ICP, and the venous edema from the um, from the clot burden. And during that time, um, you need to consider decompressive craving for anectomy or may consider um, endovascular therapy. So the treatment, um, this is gold standard, this is based on the APA guidelines that, yes, you anticoagulate. Even if there's intracerebral hemorrhage, this is covered by the APA guidelines, and they say low molecular weight heparin is actually for better outcome, less worsening of intracerebral hemorrhage. And, but it's contraindicated if you have renal insufficiency. Um, the duration, there's no good evidence whether it's greater or less than six months. So they recommend three to 12 months. They, uh, they, they're hedging. So what about DOACT, um, Pixaban or the big, In fact, they actually had two, uh, two case series on Rimuroxaban and one on a uh, case study on RESPECT. And they found that there was no difference. However, the most important thing, and I remind every um, every resident and physician treating a venous thrombosis, that this did not include the uh, this not include the acute phase. The acute phase they took 
they actually take care of the patient's bone molecular wake up in two weeks and then change to a long act. So um, the management complication is, of course, increased ICP. Um, uh, usually, we're worried about the um, vision loss for these patients. And again, this is increased ICP is significantly due to a cerebral uh, sagittal, sorry, superior sagittal thrombosis. So usually, we, um, we recommend the lumbar puncture. However, there are no studies that lumbar puncture changes overall prognosis and headache are very concerned. So usually, we just forego the lumbar puncture. We just continue anticoagulation. What about acetazolamide or diuretics? Again, there's no evidence. Uh, for steroids, it's actually only useful if you think the cerebral venous thrombosis is secondary to a autoimmune source such as Bichette's auto Bichette's or antiphospholipid So antiphospholipid syndrome, they actually found that patients who um, did not get Coumadin actually had um, excessive thrombotic. So it is, um, it is the drug of choice when you take care of patients with antiphospholipid syndrome and they have this type of disease. In them. Okay, so um, let's go to the next case. I'm so excited. This case, this is part two. Okay, so I'm good. Okay, uh, no more Zoom people. So <laughs> you can drink your coffee. So um, was that Miguel? <laughs> Hi, Miguel. Oh, I'm so excited. Miguel, you came to my lecture. I'm so excited. Okay, good. He's, he's excited, too. Okay, so Miguel, let's talk about this. is a 49-year-old woman, and uh, this is an outpatient setting, so it's very, um, this is totally out of your wheelhouse, right? Like, what is, what is clinic? What is outpatient setting? But um, I'm always delighted to have these patients in my clinic. So she's 49 years old, came on with headaches, and she came to stroke. And uh, she was referred to OBGYN for possible termination of pregnancy. She's been trying for many years, and she, she finally became pregnant. Um, but she had a history of cerebral venous thrombosis in 2000. She had a history of miscarriage. So I'm going to show you her. She, she came in with a CD. It's always, she, they always come in with a CD. So. Okay, Miguel, do you see anything? Is, it, is this a normal CAT scan? Oh, so good, yes. Oh, I'm so excited, yes. There's something called an empty delta sign, which is the radiographic sign, the superior sagittal, sagittal thrombosis. And what he said here was the cord sign. This is the sign, which is also involving the transverse. So this is probably a very extensive cerebral venous thrombosis back in 2000. So um, we have more pictures because they always come with CVs, and we don't have a CV player now in our clinic. I actually have to go upstairs. Do you see anything, Miguel? Oh, it's too fast. I know. Being unfair. So we actually noticed here, this is exactly what we talked about, which was the uh, delta sign as well. Um, but this is in the DWI MRI. Thank you so much, Miguel. Thanks. Hi, I don't know your name. Very, no, behind you. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, what is your name? Nicole. Nicole, oh, okay. thank you for playing and participating willingly. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, this is the MRI, and and this is Claire. Do you see anything abnormal here? Yes. Yes. Oh, very good. Excellent. 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 Well, you know, actually, the question is, um, it's both, both answers is yes and no. You do not see vasogenic edema, but you see clot burden, and you see it from the delta sign. So that really tells you something about it. That means the majority of her symptoms are due to increased ICP, not really for collateralization. Thing. Good job. Oh, excellent. All right. So um, I'm just going to show you guys. Um, this is something that was just recently described. Um, you see here, there's 
there is some there's some black lines here. Black lines here. It just shows that there's increased um, there's increased pot burden and infrastructural pressure on these patients. I know it's very hard to see. It looks better on the MRI, um, but it's actually called the rush spot. So um, I will just show you the um, the pot burden and um, so the pot burden was actually over here and. Uh, he went all the way to the confluence of sinuses, all the way up through the straight sinus, and into um, and almost hit the uh, main aorta. So it was a very extensive pot. And uh, this is probably one of the most impressive pots I've seen uh, in a very long time. So she was very nervous, and she said that, do I have to terminate my pregnancy unless I have this? Um, so first thing, uh, what do you do, right? You know, um, so I always, I always ask, um, uh, most of them say all the above, um, but and it's actually you need more information because 2015 was a long time ago, so this patient definitely needed feedback, re-imaging, and uh, that's exactly what we did. You know, we told them to briefly restart um, low molecular weight heparin, and um, we did that because that was actually safe for pregnancy. We told her for three to six months again, um, but then during that meantime, we actually re-imaged to see if she could count them. So that's what we did. We actually um, we found out that she had she actually had complete uh, recanalization from our um, from our short period of time. Um, she obviously had six months of anticoagulation um, in 2015 as well. But they were always worried. We amateur. We showed that there was no venous thrombosis. She was only in first trimester. Um, sorry, second trimester. So we didn't think that the risk was particularly high until six weeks after she was born. And that's what we told her. We said that um, it is reasonable to restart uh, low molecular weight heparin six weeks after the start. And that's exactly what she did. And so for future pregnancies, we said it's reasonable to start it if you're highly suspicious. But overall, she had a very good prognosis. And she did quite well. So now everyone asks me, does COVID-19 increase risk of cerebral venous thrombosis? And I say there's a case series of three. Um, that this is, to me, it's interesting, but we don't know yet. We have very still out. So these are take-home points that I always like to give. Um, remember that your infarct is hemorrhage patterns, and not all strokes are arterial. Uh, know your CBT uh, scenarios. Maintain a low threshold and evaluate cerebral venous thrombosis. You can actually alter the uh, treatment management of these patients. You anticoagulate, and you evaluate for risk factors and follow-up. So let's see here. Oh, so I have a special. Do I have time? No, I don't have time. It's okay. I do this every time it's I do okay. lecture. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm always in, I'm always believe in transparency. So uh, I do this every time I'm asked to bring lecture. Um, you guys want to know our TPA hemorrhage rates, right? <laughs> so I will show you guys. This is their TPA hemorrhage rates. Uh, as you can see, it was very high in 2000. But because of the collaboration that we had with ACT and neurology, we're actually um, doing quite well. Um, and our overall, the past six years, it's been 3.8 percent. Our average, um, national average, is it's four to six percent. So we're we're lower than national average in the TPA. I just want to let you guys know that. And our rate of TPA, actually, in academic centers, it's 15 percent. But um, so we have been around that area for academic institutions nationally. Um, and our TPA times uh, have been slowly dropping down. We used to be our, um, our mean for TPA time was 100 minutes. Um, so now we actually almost have because of the great collaboration that we have. And I just want to make sure that we continue that. I do want to say that and this is something that I've been working with Dr. Gillespie, and um, this is actually what we realized is that um, the burden of the burden of things that cause delay is the when we call stroke code and they take their time going to have. So um, we're developing a five five five, and I actually uh, got it from the ER doctor from UCLA. 
he was the medical structure in her hospital. And uh, we talked about it. And she said, five, five, five minutes home, where she actually said five minutes for the stroke to um, drive when the stroke will happen. So then five minutes for assessing the patient. Um, if the patient is medically stable, then we can proceed to CAT scan. Um, if not, then we stop. And then five minutes to make sure that the CAT scan is completed. We're in the process of trying to find the CAT scan with the CTA. But this is one of the major, a major performance projects that we are, um, that we're in the process of doing. I want to um, thank you all for just uh, taking the time to listen. Um, I know that if you invite me, that means you enjoy the invite me back, that means you enjoy the lecture. Um, are there any questions? Okay. Dr. Willis. Hi, thanks for uh, lecturing to us, Dr. Law. I have a question about the uh, venous thrombosis. Is there any recommendations or evidence about the timing of starting anticoagulation and an acute thrombosis? Oh, yes. So um, I think Dr. Willis, what he asked was, um, is there an optimal time to start anticoagulation? Um, the optimal time is to usually start it um, immediately. However, if you are unsure of the diagnosis, it's worthwhile to stop and wait, uh, especially when you're dealing with a, uh, uh, a not so dangerous cerebral venous thrombosis. For example, a superior sagittal sinus thrombosis is not actually very dangerous. It's increases ICP, but ultimately it doesn't really kill the patient. What kills the patient are the deep surgical vein, and that requires actually multiple, um, multiple diagnostic antigens. So you have to be sure. Um, usually, I would like to get a diagnosis and antibiotic within 24 hours. And, that's, uh, that's an excellent question. Do you usually start uh, a fractionated heparin initially if there's hemorrhage, just uh, so you can start it off quickly if there's so actually, that was, so that was um, that was the original thought of process of unfractionated happen might actually be um, uh, better because you can reverse it. However, um, the recent studies show that low molecular weight heparin is found to be better. Um, can't find the slide. Uh, low molecular weight is found to be better because it's a better outcome actually and less interest heparin. So that actually, I learned something in that process when I was reading through the European guidelines. They actually recommend low molecular weight heparin immediately rather than unfractionated. Because unfractionated weight heparin can cause very little, and that actually increases risk of worsening. Thank you. Is the dosing like one big per keg, like a generally? Yeah, just like a DMT. Oh, uh, I was asked if the dosing is, uh, what is the dosing of low molecular weight heparin? Um, and it is one of the parameters. <laughs> However, be, be wary that if a patient has renal insufficiency, um, they are not going to be on low molecular weight. Yes, they are going to be on low molecular weight. Is there a risk of, are there risks or situations of worsening? Because most of these thrombosis is also associated with depression. Yes, so the process, um, people are usually very nervous about um, starting anticoagulation. That's why it's important to have um, a collaboration with both the ICU and the neurology. Because usually what happens is that what's causing the cerebral venous thrombosis and the hemorrhage is not a rupture of the It's not a rupture of the artery. So it's actually a slow bleeding process, and it's usually due to the inclusion of the brain of the vein. So um, the worst thing you can do is not treat that occlusion because it, it's going to make it it's going to make it bleed worse. So I know you had those different case presentations, like one to five. Um, how indolent can this be in terms of like that clinical presentation, or are these always like very like acute presentations, oh. or is it dependent on the case type it is, so, <laughs> or um, where the where the clot is? So. What happened was in the lady in 2015, she told me how she got um, how she got diagnosed. Um, she uh, was the outside hospital and I'm um, a which hospital, but it was the outside hospital and she actually came with a headache and nausea vomiting. And they put her in the stretcher in the hallway and she she actually leaned over and she looked to vomit and she actually flipped over and hit her head and that's how she got a CAT scan. 
um, and the cats can show that she has a in a small process. Um, so it could be as indolent as that. Um, however, usually it's um, usually if you see it on the cat scan, um, that's when the shift of mindset is changed. Um, where um, not thinking of our trail, you know, thing. I usually find that that my that's usually the hardest the hardest thing to the, that's usually the hardest thing to overcome. Uh, there's a question on Zoom. Uh, in the acute phase, what are the blood pressure goals? Do you treat more as a stroke with permissive hypertension, or if they're associated ICH, do you have lower BP? Oh, yes. So that's a um, that's like a very hot topic that I have in our <laughs> ICU. Um, usually, we sit in a table and we have these very heated arguments about <laughs> blood pressure and cerebral venous thrombosis. Um, there is no um, there is no guideline on these types of patients. Come in with a bleed with cerebral venous thrombosis. One can argue that you are decreasing collateralization, drop the blood pressure too much. However, um, for simplicity's sake, we all agreed on 140 to 160, or the same as the cerebral hemorrhage band. Okay. But just, just to be mindful, the majority of our patients with cerebral venous thrombosis are young and they don't have um, outstanding that they come in young. Their, um, their mothers, recent mothers, and they don't usually have these types of okay. Any more questions? No. All right, thank you, Dr. L. Oh, I thank you so much. That wasn't 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs>